that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Notice verse 6, that God has, by his grace, raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. We have a heavenly position. And in that position, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. Uh, That doesn't make the people, the beings, the angelic creatures, the fallen angels that are there in those places, uh, that doesn't make them very happy to know that our position is there in Christ. But nonetheless, because of God's grace in saving us by his grace, that's what Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is about, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, God, in saving us by his grace, has given us that position in Christ, and uh, that doesn't make some of the heavenly creatures happy. There are some demonic creatures there. Also, if you'll notice in Ephesians chapter 4, after it talk, told us in the first three chapters about our position in Christ and why, chapter 4 then talks about our walk here and now. It says, I therefore, the, verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. And you can read chapters 4 and chapters 5 and he keeps talking consistently about our walk. And so we have a walk to, to walk for the Lord here and now, and we are to walk wisely uh, because as we walk this earth, we have an effect not only in this world, but we also have an effect because of our position in Christ in those heavenly places. Therefore, when Paul concludes the book of Ephesians, he, t- he tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 that we are to stand. So we've learned that we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, We've learned how to walk this earth circumspectly with wisdom of God. And as a result of that, uh, that we must stand against the wiles of the devil. Ephesians 6 verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Let's pray. God, our Father, we ask your help as we understand what it is to take unto us the whole armor of God and stand against the wiles of the devil, that we might do it for your glory and we might do it in your power and your might. In the Savior's name we pray. Amen. And so we have a position with Christ and we have an earthly walk and we have an enemy against us. And that enemy that against us is that spiritual wickedness in high places. They don't like us much. But they're defeated. The cross has totally won the victory for us. Romans chapter 8 says we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. Heaven is our home. The Holy Spirit has sealed us unto the day of redemption, and nothing can be taken away from us. We're already blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, and therefore it's ours, and those cannot be taken away. But what Satan would love to do is to make us ineffective for the Lord in our Christian walk here on the earth, which would also have an effect upon the principalities and powers in the heavens. Now, we talked about last week how every time we go out and share the gospel of grace and someone passes from death to life, Colossians says they, tra- they are transferred from the kingdom of, of, of Satan unto the kingdom of God's dear Son. And, uh, and so there's another person to have another position with Christ in the heavenly places. And so we're stealing, we're robbing, we're spoiling Satan through the opportunity we have to go out and live and speak for the Lord. So what Satan would want to do then is to stop us from living and speaking for the Lord. He can't ever stop us from getting to heaven once we've trusted Christ as our Savior because we didn't do anything to gain our way to heaven. It was given to us as a gift that we just trusted the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ as the payment of our sin, and God gave us eternal life. And therefore, Satan would have to defeat God in order to get us lost. And he can't do that, and so that's how secure we are in Christ. But we're, we're in a battle, and you need to be aware that you're in a battle, lest you think that life is just nice and easy, and the things that happen to you, and the temptations and the trials that you go through in life are just uh, non uh What's the word? Uh, I almost had it. <laughs> they have a consequence. I almost got it. What is it? <laughs> oh, I wonder. I can't say that. <laughs> but that's what it is. There is a consequence, and, and things are significant. Your life is important. The things that you do, the things you say, the things you stand for, 
Uh, those things are very important, and, it's, and, and it has a rippling effect that's much larger than you'll ever imagine, and it's only by coming to God's Word in faith and believing what's happening in the world, the unseen world around us, do we realize the effects that it has. Now, Satan, the only thing he has to resort to is tricks, wiles of the devil. Lies is his greatest weapon. And uh, he cannot defeat you, but he can make you think you're defeated. He, he, can't, he can't take away your salvation, but he can make you think you're lost. He, can, he can't take away your forgiveness of, in Christ, but he can make you think you're not forgiven. So Satan has all kinds of lies to work against you, and, and he can actually make you think that you cannot overcome a particular situation in life. When the Bible says that, look over in Ephesians 3, I don't know how you get past this, verse 20, now to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Now there's an exceeding greatness of God's power in us who believe according to chapter 1 and verse 19. And uh, Satan would have you to believe that that exceeding power is not there available to you. And that's just a lie of Satan that many have bought into and believed. So Satan is working against us, and the things that happen are not just physical things. There is a, a spiritual effect. There's a spiritual reason that all these things happen, and, uh, and they are demonic in nature. That, the, that is the source of, of all these attacks. Now, as we're going down through this, uh, I know that we started into the weapons of warfare last week, and we talked about being girded with the truth. But I want you to understand that my intent last week was not to talk about being girded with truth. Uh, my intent was to tell you that if we're to put on the whole armor of God, then every attack that Satan would throw at us, we have armor that's going to prepare us. God didn't leave us defenseless. God didn't leave us ill-prepared. God gave us the means by which we can indeed stand against the wiles of the devil. And in the armament that we're given, you might count six as we did last week, but there's five defensive pieces of armor, protective pieces of armor that we're to put on. And then the sword of the Spirit is offensive, and we'll get to that when we, when we get to the offensive part. But my, our intent last week was to go through the pieces of armor, and I want you to realize that God gave you a piece of armor because he knew that would be an area where Satan would attack. And so I wanted you to be aware of satanic attacks, and they will come according to the verses 13 through 17 there. It says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girded about with truth. Satan's attack will be on the truth. Now, we spent a lot of time talking about that, but, but I just wanted you to know that's an area of attack. It says, and having the, on the breastplate of righteousness. What is that? Oh, <laughs> I thought someone was walking on our roof. <laughs> uh, so Satan's second attack will be upon righteousness. Uh, we'll talk about what that righteousness is as we study it, but I just want you to realize that, that his attack is upon righteousness. The, the next thing it says in verse 14, Stand therefore having your loins, no, girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. He's going to attack peace. Uh, and it says uh, in verse 16, Above all things, taking the shield of faith. He's going to attack your faith. It says, uh, where, Wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take unto you the helmet of salvation. He's going to attack your salvation, and that salvation there is not just being saved by the grace of God now. That's the salvation that you're awaiting. That's the hope of being called up to heaven. That's the thing that's going to keep you serving and looking for the Lord to come unless he could take away the future salvation that you have, and that is the hope of the rapture. And so Satan's attack will be upon salvation. So we know then, if God is going to give us the whole armor, then these, these five areas is the five attacks of Satan. There is no more, there is no less. Of course, there's a lot of lies and ways that he can attack truth in there. There's a lot of ways he can attack righteousness. There's a lot of ways he can attack peace. There's a lot of ways he can attack faith. There's a lot of ways that he can attack your salvation. But nonetheless, those five areas are the areas that of all of Satan's attack. Now, that, that, you know, you think that, well, how could I ever stand against Satan? Well, well, that narrows it down. It gets it down to just five areas. We can handle that, right? 
Then the next thing that he does in, in the, that I wanted you to see is that in the description, description of that armor, that, that, that armor describes the way that the armor protects or the, the vital things that the armor protects. Now, we'll get into the armor, but I also want you to see that, that the armor protects something that's vital. And, uh, and so Satan's going to be attacking us in those five areas, but the parts that are covered, the loins are girded about with truth, aren't they? And you're put on a breastplate of righteousness. Your feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The shield of faith is what you're to take unto you. And a shield will protect your whole body, if you understand that. And the helmet is going to protect your, your head, the helmet of salvation. So not only we know the five area of attacks of Satan, but God in his armament relates every piece of armor to a part of our body which we would understand to protect our vital organs that would keep us alive. In a warfare, and you go back to the Old Testament, it was all battles against flesh and blood. And David, when he went out to battle and he, he fought, he fought physically, and he had physical armor on to protect him from physical blows that would either be to his head or to his heart or, or uh, uh, to his body in some way, and, and all that armor that you put on protects you. Well, before we even get into the armor, man, I want you to stop and just think about the, every piece and what God is trying to protect on you. As we know, Satan's attacks are going to come in these areas. First of all, having your loins girded about with truth. Loins. That's your midsection. Girded speaks about a cloth or a belt. And sometimes in, in, the, in the, the Roman, they didn't just use a cloth belt. They wore a leather belt. But that's the belt that, that you would wear to, to, uh, to support your midsection uh, of your body. It's a very important belt when it came to battle because in the Roman soldiers, everything, you can't put on a breastplate unless something's going to hold it up. Your, your breastplate hooked into that belt and held that in place. Uh, when you carried a sword, it was in a sheath, but in that belt, it was right there, handy for you to grab. Everything that you wore hung on that belt. That was the first piece of armor that someone put on, and the rest of the armor is added to it. It's an important piece of armor. You wouldn't think of it as protection, but it's the thing that everything hinges on. And the Bible says that we're to be girded about with truth. And from that point, everything hinges upon the truth. Uh, when it talks about that, that, that loin girded, when you talk about uh, 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 loins being girded, you not only have the, everything that the armor held, but you know, we read in that Psalms, look, look at there, I can't quote it, but Psalms uh, 18, verse 32, David describes it this way. And you get an idea of the importance of having loins girded. Psalms 18 and verse 32 says, It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. You know, when you talk about girding yourself, you have the belt, sometimes called a girdle. When you have that belt, it does two things, or uh, several things. Naturally, it holds the pieces of armor. But the other thing is, if you think about how they used to wear clothing, if they were wearing their general clothing, they're wearing a robe that would go down somewhere near their feet. Now, when you're fighting the enemy, sometimes you've got to go forward and fight. Sometimes you've got to back up and fight. Definitely on a hill, you need to stretch out and hold your balance because you're fighting uphill or downhill. And, and you need to have the freedom, the flexibility of movement. Well, the girdle was very important for that because when they gird up their loins, you read a lot about that in the Bible, don't you? The way you gird up your loins, you take all the extra uh, clothing that's hanging down and you tuck it up and you put it in your belt and you free your legs up. You can almost make a diaper out of it if you think about how they would gird it. Uh, but they would gird up their loins. That is, they would free their legs for mobility so that there's can be swiftness in movement and easy movement. It's very important in a time of battle that you have... <laughs> full flexibility and so they would gird up their loins but it's also called he said the Lord girdeth me with strength and you know the midsection of your body is where strength comes from if you take and, and I, I always say this when I play softball I always take my belt and it goes one notch tighter than normal usually usually uh, you know you want to be comfortable but when you're playing a sport or something and the weightlifters are going to lift they put those belts on and they crank it down so everything is held in and all they can have full upper body strength that way. You're, it's the strength, your, your source of strength comes from the midsection of your body. 
And, and therefore, when you're going out to battle, you want to have your loins girded about with truth. You want to be built up with the strength of that truth. You want to be free to use that truth and have total, total access to that truth. You would need your loins girded about with truth. And so the loins is the first area that the Bible talks about. But then it says there's a breastplate of righteousness. And, the, and we, we talked about Satan's attack is going to be on righteousness, but you know the breastplate, that's an important piece of armor. You know that if you're going to go out and duel with swords or spears or anything like that, that you want to protect the midsection of your body, the chest, the breastplate of righteousness. Because behind this rib cage is a very vital organ that you want to defend. If they pierce that heart, you're a goner. They jab you in the chest with a spear, you're going down. You're going to lose the, the ability to breathe. If you don't lose the, the ability to have your heart keep pumping blood, you've got to protect your breastplate, your, your breasts, your chest. And so you put on a breastplate of righteousness. You know, when you think about that and, and what the Bible's talking about then, the Bible is talking spiritually about you protecting your heart. Satan is first after you not to have the truth. But if you got the truth, then the next thing he wants to do is take your heart away from the truth. And you know, the Bible talks about uh, in, in Thessalonians that when Jesus Christ comes in judgment and allows Satan to come with all his, his false teaching, the Bible says he's going to come with, with uh, he's going to give him great delusion. It says, who loved not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Someday, this world, God is just going to turn it over and turn it loose in the hands of Satan. Why? Because not only did the people uh, not love the truth, but they had pleasure in unrighteousness. Notice they go together. Unrighteousness and truth. They turned down the truth. Why? Because they wanted to live in unrighteousness. Why did they want to live that way? Something was wrong with their heart. They didn't have a heart toward God, a heart that honored the things of God, that cared for the things of God. And I'll tell you this, that Satan's attack upon you will be to go after your heart, to take your heart and turn it from God and turn it toward this world. Therefore, even if you have the truth, you're of none effect for God at all. Satan's after your heart, so you need that breastplate of righteousness. Then it says your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Well, you know what it is to shoe a horse. Shod, we wore, we, yesterday playing baseball, we, we, it was given to me, a pair of spikes to wear. Uh, so that when you're running, you can get good traction. Well, those Roman soldiers, when they went out to battle, they didn't just go out in, in a pair of tennis shoes. They didn't go out in a pair of sandals to fight. They put on a pair of shoes that they would tighten on their feet, and on the bottom of them were spikes that would dig into the ground, because remember what all this passage is, is about you and I standing. Standing, not falling down, not slipping, not sliding back, but us standing against the wiles of the devil. And to have, do everything in order to stand, you would have your feet shod. You'd put on the spikes. You'd put on the, the shoes that, are, that would prepare you to stand against the wiles of the devil. And so your footwear is very important so that you would be prepared not to slip, so that you would not fall. And that's what Satan would have you to do. Satan would have you to slip, backslide, fall back, fall away. And, and that's what Satan would be trying to get you to do. And, and it's called uh, the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Prepared to bring peace. And Satan would have you to slip away from bringing peace, perhaps make you part of the problem rather than pro part of the peace. Someone who caused the conflict rather than caused the peace. And so Satan would work in that area. Then it says, take unto you the shield of faith. Uh, whereby you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. In a Roman soldier, not only would he have the, 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 the loins girded, he'd have on the breastplate, and then he would have his feet shod so he's ready to go, but he's not going to go without that shield. <laughs> no fool would go out there without that shield. And you know, when you read in the Old Testament about a buckler, the Lord is the buckler, well, that, that's a shield that you would actually carry, and you could swing a, a sword and then put up the, the shield. But the shield that you got here is a shield that sometimes you see the Roman guys carrying out there, and it's almost as big as they are. It stands almost, you know, maybe not quite six foot, but probably about five foot. And it's such a big shield that they can actually stand behind it. One of the things that made David so great in war is David taught Israel to use the bow. 
Because you know what happened? You line your whole armies up and they all shoot bows. That's like for us throwing grenades. Man, those, those Roman soldiers would line up and you'd have a hundred, a hundred men shoot arrows into the air, aim to come down on that enemy, uh, and, and where is that enemy going to run? You think you're going to take a little shield and <laughs> pick them off? Uh, there's no way. What a Ro- what you would go out to battle, and if you came across an enemy like that, what you would want to have is that shield of faith that can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, because even though you got a breastplate on, those enemies could take and not only shoot an arrow, but they'll just light it on fire too. So if it doesn't penetrate and just connects, and it's stuck in your breastplate and it's burning, well, it, it's going to burn you. It's going to get you anyhow. But if you had a shield that's so big that you could actually stand behind it when the arrows are flying so that all of them go past you and what doesn't go past you does not penetrate that shield, you could protect yourself. So you're talking about protecting your whole body there. And, and that's what God would do through faith is to protect us from all the fiery darts of the wicked. And, and there's all kinds of things they can hurl at you. And the, the shield is what's going to protect you, you holy. But then the last thing there is the helmet of salvation. The helmet. And of course, you're going to take that helmet and you're going to put it on and that helmet will go right down among, between your eyes, won't it? It'll go down between your eyes and around your forehead, protect all the back of your head because when you're out there in battle, you don't want to get hit in the head. That's a deadly blow. And you know, there's something that Satan's going to work against you and that is he's after your mind, not just your heart. He's, he's out to control your mind and, 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 dis- and hurt you and, and mentally uh, take care of you. That is, he can attack you with fear and cause you to get off the field. He can tax you with, with discouragement and cause you to quit fighting the battle. He can fill you full of despair and your mind will then decide, I can't fight the battle that God has me to fight. So Satan's out there trying to get to your mind and stop you from fighting. But the helmet of salvation protects your mind. So, so all the areas that Satan is going to attack, God has a defense for. And those defense protects us from all those things and, and covers our heart, it covers our mind, it covers our whole body, it covers our standing on our, by our feet, it, covers, it gives us the strength to go out. Now in that strength, verses 10 and 11 keep saying it. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Our strength is going to come from the Lord. That just like David said that he went out and it was the Lord who defended him, the Lord who fought his battles, the Lord who gave him strength. So it is that when you and I go out, we don't then take the armor of God and say, okay, I'm going to do this. No, everything that we have, we have in Christ. And the strength that we have, we better recognize that it's the strength that God gives us. It's his truth, isn't it? it it's his righteousness that we want to stand in. It's his gospel of peace that he's given to us. We want to stand with our feet shod by the preparation of the gospel of peace that he gave us. We want to have the helmet of salvation that he gave us. So we don't go out there and stand on our own. This is all God's armament. But yet it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So I look at this and I realize that God has totally equipped me and it's his power, his strength, everything is his, it's his armor, and yet I have to put it on, don't I? This is not something that we have a position in Christ that cannot be taken away, but as we go through the pieces of armor, this is not just an automatic thing that you have automatic protection of God. You see that? It, it, you're in the section of Ephesians that says, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. Verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God. You might be secure in Christ and and sealed in Christ and have that position in Christ, but you better take the things that he's given you in order to go out and fight the warfare. Otherwise, you're not automatically protected. It just doesn't come out that you go out there and automatically God puts up a shield. God automatically puts on a breastplate, throws a breastplate on you. God automatically puts a helmet on you just as you need it. These are something that God tells you to go out and put on. And what you're putting on, it's you're putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're putting on His armament, not your own. It's not your way of thinking, truth you devise, and all the rest. It's the things that God has given us. It's His armor, but we have to put it on. And so what you have in the armament here is the things that God has given us positionally. We have to learn to take and use it practically for the Lord. Everything is a positional truth, 
but it's now becoming practical truth as we put it on and use it for God's glory. Not just be seated with it, stand with it. And so we're going from our, our position to our practice. We're going from our, 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 our what uh, uh, standing in Christ as far as position to what state we have as we live the Christian life for him. What state are we in, spiritually con- considering? And so we're to take unto us the whole armor of God. When you stop and think about that, you need to stop and reflect that then for his truth, we talked all about truth yesterday and how he gave truth and how important truth is to God. Actually, yesterday, last week. But what you've got to do now is take unto you the truth of God, don't you? You have to take it. You have to receive it. Come over to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. He's given us wonderful positions and blessings in Christ. In verse 12 it says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. So we who first trusted in Christ, we, we are going to be to the praise of his glory. But how is it that we first trusted in Christ? It says in verse 13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You know, the, the gospel, the, 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 the word of salvation, the gospel of, uh, uh, the word that ye have heard, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation was presented, wasn't it? But didn't you have to receive it? it did, you're not automatically saved until you receive it. Just as you got saved by receiving the truth, now you're being told, now that you're saved and you're blessed and you will be, according to those verses, you will be to the praise of the glory of his grace who first trusted in Christ. That's assured. But now, now, in order to stand against the wiles of the devil, you need to take the truth unto yourself. You still have to receive the truth. And it's not just the truth of your salvation, it's the truth that God has in his word for you to know. You have to receive it. So as I think about the the armament, we have to, his truth then has to become our truth. Do you know the difference between that? His truth is here. Now what do you stand on? What do you stand with? How do you live your life? Well, his truth will always be here. But somewhere along the line, you've got to re- take unto you the whole armor of God. You've got to take that truth and put it in here and put it down in your heart and make it part of you. It'll always be His truth. It won't be your truth. It'll be His truth. But you've got to take His truth and put it in you so that you can stand in the truth. You have to take it unto you. Uh, we were talking yesterday on the phone, uh, Lisa and I, and we were just talking about children in, in the assembly. And how much I realize that you can sit here and, and all the things can be taught to you, but that's not yours yet until you receive it. You have to take unto you those truths. You, we can, you can be taught in all the right ways. You can be taught all the facts about the Bible. You can be taught that the Bible is true. But you don't stand in that until you yourself decide, yes, I'll take that truth unto myself. And the first thing that you need to take unto yourself is the truth of the gospel of your salvation, that you're a sinner and you need to be saved. And you cannot save your, yourself. You talk about the loins girded about with truth, uh, and that, the, 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 that, the, that being girded is, is God's strength. You know what it says in Romans chapter 5? When you, when you were without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. You don't have the strength to save yourself. You need to take unto you his salvation, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, who went to the cross and paid for your sins on the cross and and rose again to be the justifier, to declare you righteous before a holy God if you'll believe on him. When you make that choice to believe on him, you know what you're doing? You're taking the truth of the gospel of your salvation and making it salvation for you. You know, the truth of the gospel of salvation is for everybody, isn't it? And will be. Like, no one can take that away. But they're not saved, are they? Until they take unto themselves that truth by faith, believe it, and it becomes theirs. 
And so it is that all the what God says to us in this Bible, to specifically to us, but that'll be in under faith, we'll talk about that, but all the truth of God has to be taken unto you, and you can sit there all you want, and you can just be like, like the children, you can listen to me say these things, but they're not yours until you spend some time in the book, and you do some acknowledging before God that this is truth. This is what I'm going to stand for. This is right. This is what I believe. His truth has to become your truth. And you know, the same thing is true about righteousness. The moment you trust Christ as your Savior, you're found in Christ, not having your own righteousness, but his righteousness. You're, you're found, the Bible talks about you, the, the, what we believe today, is that the righteousness of God is imputed to us who believe. The moment we believe, his righteousness is put to our account in heaven. That's positional truth. But now we've got to take positional truth and take it unto ourselves for practical truth, don't we? And what that is, look over here in Ephesians, go back to chapter 4. It says in verse 22, that ye put off concerning the form of conversation the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You know what that is now? The righteousness that you've been given of, by God is now the righteousness you want to take and live out in your life. And it's not your righteousness, not your standard. <laughs> we're talking to, to, to Mike the other day, he, we were talking about the South, uh, about mixed bathing. And uh, all the kids, well, bathing, what are you talking about? They said, well, when you go swimming, what do you put on? They said, well, bathing suit. In the South, they call that mixed bathing. And years ago, it was looked at as a sin. Now, down in the South, you could stand on a, uh, on a porch of a church, smoke a cigarette, and walk in and worship God, walk out and have another cigarette. No one think a thing about it. But if you say, well, this afternoon I'm going mixed bathing, <gasps> now you're sinning. Well, what that is, is they have a standard of righteousness that they've set up. And if you come up north, we have a different standard. Don't stand on a porch and smoke a cigarette. But if you're going swimming, that's fine. Uh, our standard different. But this is not what we're talking about when we're talking about take unto you his righteousness. We're talking about letting this be the standard of what right and wrong is. What he, what, how he would have us to live and put on the righteousness that he instructs us to walk in. That, that's, that's the righteousness that we were, were to instructed to stand in. The, the peace that God offers us is the peace that we need in our life, the practical peace we need in our life. You know, in life, you've got all kinds of ways of trying to get peace, don't you? You want to sit down and, and just relax and meditate. that give you some peace. Or, or uh, just let me alone and give me some peace and quiet. And so we have ways of getting our own peace. But the Bible says, take unto you His peace and let that be the peace. You know what that is? That's learning about the peace that you have with God. The peace that you have, not only the peace with God, but the peace of God in your life that passes all understanding that you have as an opportunity through prayer to receive. That you can live this life with God's peace working in you. And you don't have to have peace and quiet to have peace. You can be going through all kinds of turmoil if you'll take his peace into your life. And this is what the goal is in taking on all these pieces of armor. It's not you, it's him. It's taking unto you his, the things that he offers, truth, his righteousness, his peace, and his faith. And when you get into faith, the, the world got this faith, it's my faith, what I believe, or, or they just go through the Bible and choose all kinds of things to believe. But the faith is believing what God says to you, and what God says to you, you're going to have to believe in and, and live for. And then the helmet of salvation, the salvation that God offers you is the hope. And I don't know what helps you get through hard times, but if it's looking forward to vacation, that'll come and go. If it's looking for a raise, if it's looking for, for acceptance by people, none of those things will ever get you all the way accepted and finally fulfilled in life. But there's a hope that God offers that keep your whole life focused, that keep you all glued together from falling apart, keep your affections together as you set your affections on things above, and will take you all the way through life and peacefully into the glory. And that's the helmet of salvation. But that's the salvation he offers, not the salvation you go out and create yourself. So as you see, all these pieces of armor are the things that God offers us. Uh, and so just going back then, and we're going to look at each one and, and not spend a whole lot of time in each one, but not, not cover them all today either. I want to talk to you about uh, 
being girded about with truth. Let me just say to you, just in, on your own, you can look up the verses. Exodus chapter 12, verse 11. The nation of Israel, you know when they ate the Passover, you know how they were to eat it? With their loins girded. <laughs> the way the Passover, they had to eat in a hurry. They had to stand up and eat the Passover with their loins girded. Why? Because deliverance was coming. They were going to be ex, they're going to exit Egypt the next day. It's going to be the salvation of God. They're going to go out. And they're going to follow God through the wilderness and then, then into the, their promised land. So as they were eating in the Passover, they were eating uh, with their loins girded because that represents the freedom of movement, ready to go. And we're to have our loins girded about with truth. Truth is what's going to give you the freedom to go. You know, if you're going to stand against the wiles of the devil, all his attacks are going to come in the form of a lie. What's the best way to defend yourself against a lie? Get a book on the cults and then read all about the cults. And when you finish that book, you find out they just began a new cult over here. And you got to go read another book about that cult. Then you got to buy the book, All the Religions of the World. And you got to read all the religions of the world and, and what, what they're teaching and what's wrong. Do you have to do all that to protect yourself from the lie of Satan? Or all you got to do is receive unto yourself the truth of God. And if you know the truth, and you hear a lie, you know what a lie is, don't you? You know what that is? It's being girded about with truth. Yeah. And so Israel was girded that way. You know, when I talk about a leather girdle, you know who wore a leather girdle, don't you? John the Baptist wore a leather girdle. He did it like Elijah. And, you know, that's, that's unusual because in Israel's custom, they wore a cloth girdle. But John the Baptist had a leather girdle because he had more important business to do. He needed something a little bit stronger. He needed something that was going to give him a little bit more strength. He wore a leather girdle. And he went out to be a spokesman for God. And in, in, in being a leather girdle, it, it freed him to keep on traveling for the Lord. And, and that's why John the Baptist wore a leather girdle. It was for him to have the freedom to keep going. Uh, come over with me to John chapter 8. We're just about done here. Hang on with me. John chapter 8. And Rick has let me know that we misquoted this on our Message of Grace program. He's anxious for us to correct it, but that takes work. <laughs> you probably know this verse. John chapter 8 and verse 32. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Uh, I heard set free too. <laughs> it does say make you free. Uh, we quoted on our TV program that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And I got a dove flying in the air and it just matched perfectly. Yeah, I just misquoted the verse. You know, there is a difference when you stop and think about it, about being set free and made free. See, set free is free. Where do I go? What do I do? I don't know. You just lost. You're up to yourself now. But made free, that's what we are in Christ. We're free from sin, free to use our liberty to glorify God. Not just set free, but made free. And, and the Bible tells you what makes you free, doesn't it? Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's why you've got to be girded about the loins with truth. Why? You're free. You've got that flexibility of movement. And that's what truth will enable able you to do. Satan will lie to you, and you'll immediately recognize it. You won't have to go study to figure out if it's right or wrong. You'll know truth and error because you know what truth is, and everything that's not truth is error, is lies, and it's of Satan. And, and so that gives you that, that quick quickness to respond and makes you free in the sense that, that it's not going to penetrate and bring you down. Rome, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, not only are we saved by the gospel of truth, remember what that says? It says, speaking the truth and love may grow up unto him in all things. You know what the truth will do? It cause you to grow. It'll cause you to be not only stronger, bigger, because truth will bring about growth. I'd like you to come over with me to the closing verses, 2 Timothy. Chapter 2. And I want to warn you, if you don't gird yourself, what you're facing. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. Verse 18, first of all, speaks about two men. It says, 2 Timothy 2.18, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is already passed. 
Uh, they erred in the hope of their salvation, that's for sure. They thought the resurrection already took place and they missed it. Uh, but anyhow, nonetheless, these two men have erred from the truth. Now, you know what happens if you err from the truth? First of all, you've got to take it unto you, <laughs> otherwise you're exposed. But now you take it unto you, but now you've got to be careful that you don't err from it. Because if you err from it, look down in verse 24. Paul writes to Timothy and he tells him how to deal with such men like this. It says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, if God peradventure, will give them repentance to the, uh, repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and, and they shall recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him, at his will. Uh, boy, if you look at that, you begin to realize that these guys who have erred from the truth, Timothy, patiently deal with them, keep giving them the truth and waiting and waiting, and if they'll acknowledge that truth, God is granting them repentance unto life. How is he granting them that? By someone being patiently given the person who's in error of the truth and being patient, keep doing it, and when they finally will acknowledge the truth, they'll free themselves from the snare of the devil. They had caught in a snare. But you know what they did? Now look, look at verse 25. In meekness instructing them, here's what I want you to see, that what? Oppose themselves. Boy, you talk about the lie, the tricks of the devil. If he can get you into an error, you know what you're doing? You're working against yourself. You're in an error propagating a false message which is actually hurting you and binding you and not causing you to be free. And Satan, by you getting into an error, you have opposed yourself. You're fighting yourself. That's the snare of the devil. He'll just tie you up in lies. Truth is something important that frees you up. And the warning of 2 Timothy chapter 4 is this. 2 Timothy chapter 4 Timothy is said, uh, verse 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come. Now watch out that it don't come to you, because in time this is going to happen. The t the t for the time will come when they shall not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall heap to themselves t teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. There's going to come a time in this world that this world will no longer endure truth. And they'll just get someone in to say things that are nice to hear and then they'll be turned unto fables. And if you're turned unto fables, you're opposing yourself, aren't you? You have to be careful your own time, in your own study that you don't get tired of always trying to discover and search out and know the truth. You've got to be careful you don't get to the point that I don't need to study anymore. Just bring someone, let them tell me some things. Make me feel good and I'll just go home and feel fine. And what you'll do is you'll just be caught in the snare of the devil and never know it. And the Bible warning you, is warning you that such a time is coming on this earth when the far majority is going to want that. And I believe it's here. You watch out that you don't get caught in the snare of the devil. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for your word, and we realize the importance for us meeting at such times as this. And if a message is dry, if a message is boring, Father, if it's true, we better perk up and listen. And Father, we pray that we'll gird our loins about with truth, that we might be ready to give the truth, ready to expose the lie, that we might have the freedom that we have in Christ to live and rejoice in, in all the wonderful things you've given us and not oppose ourselves and be turned unto fables. Thank you for such truth as these. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's close by singing the chorus to number 302 one more time. Accept it in the Beloved.